This is for Monday, October the 5th. This is the end of Lesson 5. Well, if we were to take the lessons that we learned from the Constitutional Convention and apply them to today, we would find that our legislative branch is broken up into two chambers. The United States House of Representatives is composed of 435 members. Membership for each state is based on population. This is the Virginia plan. The United States Senate is composed of a hundred members with each state receiving two members. This is the New Jersey plan. Now for an idea to become law it must be passed in both chambers it must be passed in identical fashions. However, Article I of the Constitution does give the House and the Senate what we call unique powers. Any bills that deal with money, whether we are spending money or we are bringing money in, or what is called ways and means, must begin in the House. Uh, the president may say he wants to lower taxes, or the senator might say he wants to raise spending for this or for that, but technically they can't do that. It has to begin in the House. Now, the Senate has what's called the power of advise and consent. Now, be careful how you write it in your notes. It's A-D-V-I-S-E. Advise and consent is where the president has chosen a Member, for example, President Trump just recently announced that he was going to fill a seat on the Supreme Court, and he announced who the judge will be. Now, she will not become a judge, though, unless the Senate advises and consent. Now, right now, all you have to do is have a simple majority. So she would have to get at least 51 votes. Any bill that's passed by Congress automatically goes to the president. Now, the president can do a variety of things. The president can immediately put his name on it, and the bill becomes law. The president can twiddle his thumb for 14 days, and even though he hasn't signed it, the bill becomes law. Or the president may veto the law. Now, veto means reject. So in this particular case, the president has rejected the law. However, if the Congress feels strong enough about the bill, they can pass the bill over the president's objections if they can get two-thirds majority from each house. The president runs the day-to-day -day affairs of the country. He is the commander in chief. So if a bad guy was to militarily threaten the United States, it would be up to our president to make the final decision. Our president is the leader of foreign policy. What he says will determine what the United States will do with this country or with that country. But the president can be removed from office. If the president has committed treason, or what is called a high crime or misdemeanor. Now, typically this would mean a felony, but really any wrongdoing. The first step is for a majority of the House to vote for impeachment. The second phase would be for two-thirds of the Senate to agree and remove him. Now, President Trump was impeached by the House, but he could, but the Senate did not remove him from office. The final branch of government is the court system. Now, the national court is called the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is considered the most powerful court in the land. No state decision is more powerful than the Supreme Court. So let's say that um, a person is convicted of a horrendous crime and sentenced to death. The Supreme Court can rule him that he's not supposed to get debt. Well, if there's a, a decision, who is right, the state or the federal? Well, in this case, it's the federal. 
Congress will create inferior courts. And the inferior courts are called the Court of Appeals and the District Court. Now, for example, here in Jefferson City, we have a branch of the Kansas City District Court. Now, originally, the Constitution said that the courts would settle disputes between states, that the courts would settle disputes between the president and the legislative branch. But now, the courts have an additional job, and that is to look at an action by the president, look at an action by the legislative branch, and determine if it is constitutional or not. Now, our Constitution doesn't say anything at all about that. During the Jefferson administration, the, court, the courts in a case called Madison versus Marbury will rule a particular idea by the Washington administration as unconstitutional. No, the, the president didn't mind, the Congress didn't mind, so this has set precedent for all future courts. The Constitution allows for amendments. Now, we originally had 10, and these 10 amendments are what we call the Bill of Rights. And then starting with Amendment 11 to Amendment 27, we have made changes to the Constitution because of problems that were found in the Constitution. Or we have made amendments to provide for social experiments. Now, of the Bill of Rights, the one that pretty much everybody remembers is the First Amendment. And the First Amendment talks about freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and freedom to provide, to prevent grievances to, to the government. Amendment 2 is the one that kind of makes the news all the time. This is the one that talks about the right to bear arms. Amendment 3 talks about the militia and the fact that the militia or the army cannot be housed in private citizens' homes except during times of war. In Article 1 of the Constitution, there is a section that is called the Elastic Clause. Now, the Elastic Clause is the idea that Congress can take up a notion even though the Constitution does not talk about it. So, for example, there's nothing in the Constitution that talks about cell phones, yet we have laws that deal with cell phones. Well, how can Congress make up a law that deals with cell phones? This is because of the Elastic Clause. In 1788, a, major, oh, a majority of the states had voted in favor of the Constitution. North Carolina and Delaware had not, but they soon would. The Electoral College is going to meet. They will elect George Washington, the first president of the United States. Now, back in those days, we did things a little bit different than we do today. If you were a white male over 21 years of age and had paid either property tax or a business tax, then you could vote for your local congressman. But that was it. The state government would convene its, its state legislature, and the state legislature would pick the representatives for the United States Senate. But who's going to pick the president? The Constitution in Article 2 talks about the Electoral College. Now, the Electoral College is a bunch of people who back then were chosen by the, by the legislative branch of the state. Now, what would happen is each state would get a certain number of votes to determine the number of votes. You would take your number of representatives plus your two senators, add those numbers together. Well, that's how many votes the state would have. Then the Electoral College would meet in early December, and they would take ballots, and the guy who got the most votes would be president. And the guy who got the second most votes 
would be vice president. Then, in March of the next year, the votes would be counted by the Speaker of the House in front of all the members of the House. If it was apparent that a candidate had received one more than half of the votes, then the candidate would be invited on the third Monday of the third full week of March to be sworn into office. And in March of 1789, George Washington would be given the oath of office on a balcony of what is now Wall Street in New York City. Today, though, the Electoral College is much different. Today, the American people choose their representatives. The American people choose their senators. Now, here in our state, we are like 48 of the other states. The people will go to the polls in November, and whichever candidate receives the most votes, and it does not have to be a majority, whichever candidate receives the most votes will get all of the state's electoral college. So right now, the most electoral college votes you could get would be 538. So we divide that by 2 and add 1, and we come up with 270. So whichever candidate, whether it be Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, and again, I think these are the only two guys who really stand a chance of winning in November, whoever gets 270 or more votes, that person will become president of the United States. Well, let's just say for grins and giggles that the Electoral College cannot decide then the president will be chosen by the House of Representatives with each state getting one vote. And the vice president will be elected by the United States Senate with each state getting one vote. Now, we have had a situation where it has had to be that way in 1824. Also again in 1876, although Congress came to a a uh, compromise. We'll have to see what happens in 2020. Well, we are done with Lesson 7. I have passed out to the class a walkout worksheet worth five points. If you are watching this at home and not in school today, then you need to do the walkout worksheet as well. It deals with, with everything we've gone over in Lesson 7. Tomorrow, we will start on Lesson 8, which is the Washington, and then we'll do the John Adams administration. Now, we have school on Friday, but it's going to be standardized testing. So, I would imagine that we probably won't get done until next Wednesday or maybe Thursday. Next week, we'll do another walkout worksheet over Lesson 8. And also next week, we're going to do a walkout worksheet over the first eight lessons, there'll be five questions, and these will be for multiple choice. Excuse me, these will be for extra credit. So you could make as many as five extra credit points next week. Please make sure that you look at your facts score. Make sure that your facts score is correct. On the 16th of, of October, that's basically two weeks from now, we end the first quarter. And That'll also be your midterm grade for Lincoln University.